it's a real pleasure to come and talk to you all. I'm sorry it's taken a little while to make it happen, but um, it's really nice to see you all. Hopefully at some point in the future, it might be a, a physical um, meeting as well. That would be lovely. Um, so as Carl explained, I am based at UCL. So I'm a professor in the mechanical engineering department and I also run our Institute of Healthcare Engineering, which is essentially all about interfacing um, engineers, mathematicians, physical scientists with um, medical scientists and clinical colleagues um, across our medical school and linked hospitals. So um, basically all of my, my work is about working at that interface really. So um, my, my research is around using mathematical and computational modeling as a tool in medicine biology. And today I'm gonna to talk about um, work that I've done actually dating back to my PhD. So quite some time ago, which looks at um, essentially modeling fluid and solute transport in vascular tissues with a particular emphasis on cancers um, and using them to better understand um, the kind of maps that you get in diagnostic imaging and how you can use that information to inform therapeutic strategies as well. Right, so why are we interested in blood flow modeling? And um, I suspect most of you are familiar with how blood flow in your body works, um, but for the uninitiated, essentially Throughout your body, we've got a vascular network, which essentially takes oxygen rich blood from our lungs and distributes it throughout our body according to the needs of your cells. So every cell in your body needs oxygen to, to function. And the vasculature, which is the, the blood vessel network, essentially performs that role of, if you like, taking that oxygen rich source and distributing it through your body according to the metabolic requirements of individual cells. Obviously, different body, um, different tissues in your body, different organs have different metabolic requirements. So you can imagine that your heart, for example, um, when you're exercising, has a much higher um, oxygen demand than other tissues. For example, cartilage tissue is known for having quite low oxygen requirements. So in line with that, your blood vessel networks and architectures um, have quite different structures depending on the individual tissue that they're serving if you like and they can also change in time through a variety of processes like regulation um, angiogenesis which is blood vessel growth and remodeling to meet specific demands of the tissues. So I find all this quite fascinating and um, this image on the left hand side here is a reconstruction of a small piece of the micro um, circulation which are the smallest blood vessels in a rat cerebral cortex you can see you've got feeding vessels, which are the arterioles in red, and um, the blue vessels are the draining vessels called the venules, and then the um, green vessels are capillaries, which are essentially where gas exchange occurs, and they're the smallest vessels. Um, and essentially, there's a, there's a really interesting role for modelling to play in understanding what these kind of structures mean in terms of the blood flow maps that you get in individual tissues, so that partly we can diagnose conditions that might relate to having abnormal blood flow maps, um, but also understanding how things like um, oxygen um, is delivered as well as um, therapeutics. So for example, a drug, drugs are often delivered systemically in your bloodstream by your vasculature. So this is an area that I've been working in since my PhD days and actually in writing this talk, it was quite nice because I went back to my um, PhD um, and thought about some of the stuff that I did then. Um, which it was very nice to do and just shows that if you're doing a PhD now that um, you might end up doing that in however many years time so make sure you pay lots of attention. <laughs> so these are what this is a kind of bit of a summary of what blood network structures look like and um, essentially the vasculature is a continuous hierarchy as I said so it, it starts with the highest sorry the largest um, vessels like the arteries which are feeding vessels so they feed um, oxygen um, basically, um, and they is a kind of a continuous hierarchy that goes right down to the microcirculation and then back out through the veins, which are your drainage system. There's a very kind of oversimplified schematic at the bottom here um, that shows the map of like arteries and um, arterioles are kind of intermediate um, feeding vessels. Capillaries are where, in general, all gas exchange um, with tissue occurs. They're usually an interconnected mesh network structure as opposed to a branching structure, which is more what you get with the arteries and arterioles. And then the venules are the kind of mirror system which, which drain fluid out of an individual tissue. 
Vessels are often classified according to their diameter. Um, as I said, essentially the largest vessels are about a millimeter to a centimeter in diameter. Um, and the, the capillaries are say 10 microns up to about 100 microns. These are very, very, very kind of loose numbers, but it gives you an idea of the order of magnitudes. And then on the right here, there's some scanning electron micrographs of vascular architectures in different tissues, just to show you how much they vary from tissue type to tissue type. So for example, at the top here, this is a chicken retina where you can see these really nice parallel structures. And um, this one's a mouse epicardium, which is cardiac tissue, heart tissue. This is a mouse and mammary gland, a kidney and skeletal muscle. So really that's just to get the idea across that the architectures and individual tissues are very much um, variable. So they vary from tissue, tissue type to tissue type, but actually also from individual to individual. And it's interesting to understand what that means in terms of blood flow. Again, this, this kind of just re-emphasizes that point, but specifically with a slant looking at tumors. So in tumors, so cancers, um, essentially the normal regulatory mechanisms that underpin growth of vasculature um, are um, altered. And so you can get quite chaotic and irregular vascular architectures. And these are four different cancer cell lines on the right hand side here. And you can see that they've got all sorts of features that are what we might call abnormal. So more chaotic, irregular structures, um, variation in diameters, lengths, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's compared to on the left hand side here again is the this is, um, this is a healthy kind of colorectal tissue where you can see this nice repeating honeycomb structure. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is how we can understand what these kind of structures mean like, mean for um, blood flow and perfusion at the scale of a tissue um, for cancers. And this really takes me to kind of the main purpose of, of the modeling in the context that I'm gonna talk about today which is that we now have really amazing imaging tools which allow us to look at you know, really fine scale structures and in individual tissues and you know, a whole range of different um, imaging tools that can be used clinically to look at what blood flow maps look like in you know, whole tissue samples or whole organs. And there's a really interesting question, which is how you, how you relate between the two. So on the top here, this is an image from our groups, which is um, from optical imaging of colorectal tumor vessels. So these are really small vessels. Um, if you have information about, about um, vascular structure at that scale, what would you expect to see on the scale of a whole organ or tissue? Um, and what can we infer about those kind of maps that can be useful in either a clinical setting to inform kind of diagnostic strategies or therapeutic strategies, or in a more kind of fundamental sense to understand the role of tissue transport. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to talk about two different approaches to um, modeling in these kind of settings. So first of all, multi-scale continuum models. So, so there I'm gonna talk about how you can use different averaging approaches to derive tissue scale information based on information on um, vascular architecture at the fine scale. And then I'm gonna talk about a different approach um, which I refer to as discrete vessel models where instead we, we describe flow in, in every individual vessel in a whole tissue sample. And then I'll kind of discuss the pros and cons of the different approaches and how we're working to try and bridge between the two. Right, so this is the bit that takes me back to my PhD and I'm, I'm kind of telling the story of how we've done this work um, chronologically to a large extent. Um, so when I first started thinking about this problem, um, essentially I was interested, as I just said, in trying to understand what fine scale capillary architecture means in terms of tissue scale perfusion. And you know, how we should write down um, model systems on the tissue scale that, that adequately describe um, the, the architecture and, you know, function in terms of blood flow at, at the capillary scale. And to tackle this, um, we can use a range of different approaches, but one, one approach is to use um, averaging methods such as asymptotic homogenization to basically um, mathematically average these kind of structures on the fine scale to derive the tissue scale equations. So if you zoom into an individual point on a tissue, you can see the fine scale microarchitecture where you have distinct um, blood, you know, vascular, so blood vessel and interstitial phases. Interstitial just means the bit in this context means the, the tissue outside with the blood vessels. Um, and so on this scale, I don't know if you can see my pointer, <laughs> but um, you can, great. Okay, so on this scale, you can see, um, you've got blood vessels, you've got interstitium, and you can write down 
equations describe blood flow mass transport in each of those different phases. Um, and then what I'm just going to talk through now is how you can then use asymptotic homogenization to essentially exploit the disparity between these length scales to derive tissue scale equations. And these tissue scale equations are at the length scale where you might get clinical imaging data such as magnetic resonance imaging or um, PET data. Right, and I'm going to talk through a bit of the maths, um, which um, hopefully will be interesting. So um, this is a kind of example of how you can do this for flow. Oops, sorry. So if you start on your zoomed in capillary scale, you've got these um, architectures and we're going to assume here that the setup is periodic, which is a, a really significant assumption. Um, it's, it's necessary for the simplest of these um, homogenization models and I'll, I'll return to that later. If you assume you've got a repeating structure on the micro scale, then essentially you can write down Stokes flow equations, for example, for flow in the individual vessels, which is what we've got here. So U here is the blood velocity and the C subscript represents capillaries. P is the fluid pressure. Um, mu is the viscosity of the blood. And then in the interstitium, so the surrounding phase. So this is basically a, a mixture of um, matrix, so proteins and cells, which you can describe um, using or flow through it using um, Darcy's law, so treating it like a porous medium. So here I've got um, the fluid velocity UT. So here T is denoting the tissue phase. And then um, Darcy's law just says that the velocity is proportional to the pressure gradient. And that constant of proportionality essentially captures the permeability of the interstitium, which is the K and the viscosity of the blood. You then need boundary conditions. Um, so here I've prescribed um, continuity of the normal component of the velocity on the boundaries. And then that we, we, we basically use Starling's law to say that if you've got a pressure drop across the, the vessel wall, then that drives the flux of fluid across it. And that's this relationship here. And the LP describes the permeability of the wall. So that's the vascular permeability. And then finally, this last equation is the beavis joseph slip condition, which you need to close the problem. And it's just a condition on the tangential component of the velocity. Um, so how can you tackle this? Well, I mentioned before that we want to take advantage of the disparity in the length scales in the problem. So it's natural to non-dimensionalize. So here we're starting on the fine scale. So I'm non-dimensionalizing with D, which is the kind of repeating length unit on the micro scale. This is just the standard pressure, um, viscous pressure scale. Capital U is the um, a typical fluid velocity. And this is your kind of effective time scale. You then get um, the analogous system of equations which are non-dimensionalized and of course they've got various dimensionless parameters encoded within them. So here epsilon is the ratio of the local length scale to the tissue length scale and d over l which we're assuming will be small. Um, you've got your Reynolds number comparing your um, viscous to inertial effects. Um, your kappa here is basically just tells you how permeable your interstitium is. Capital R is, a, is the measure of the permeability of the vessel walls. And this phi is the slip parameter, which um, is less important. Now this epsilon, the whole kind of hypothesis of this approach is that this epsilon is small. And so you can treat the two different length scales as independent, in which case you can essentially expand your gradient operators in terms of a locally varying component and a globally varying component, and then perform asymptotic expansions of all your different variables and equate powers of epsilon to determine um, what's happening at different orders and on different scales. So I'm going to quickly talk you through how that works um, in this situation. So very quickly, just to do parameter estimation, one of the big morals of the story here is that, you know, when you're looking at tissues, even if you pin down an individual tissue, it's very hard to get um, accurate parameters and they can really vary a lot depending on um, the individual tissue sample um, and all sorts of different factors. But broadly speaking, the assumption of scale separation is reasonable. Um, the Reynolds number will generally be small for the microcirculation, which means that you've got a viscous dominated flow. And then it's very difficult to estimate things like the permeability of the interstitium and the permeability of the vessel walls. And indeed, they'll vary massively. So <laughs> the approach here is to pick the scalings that keep them in the models at leading order, and then you can always knock them out if you had more information to inform that. And this is kind of how it works. So once you make your assumption of scale separation, you can then expand um, your equation set. So this is the interstitial domain. So starting with um, 
the Darcy equations. So here's your conservation of mass expression in the multi-scale format. This is your expression of your velocity in terms of your pressures. And this is the flux boundary condition on the wall. So this is essentially U dot N is the Starling's law. These are the kind of canonical scalings that you have to pick for kappa and R to essentially keep them in the model at leading order. And then um, you do multi-scale expansions of all your different variables. So here is the velocity and the pressures um, in powers of epsilon. So you have a leading order component, which is the, the zero um, annotated with the zeros and then the order epsilon corrections in the standard way. And then equate powers of um, coefficients of powers of epsilon. So if you do that for the um, order one system, you get that the global Laplacian of the leading order pressure is zero in the interstitium with a no flux relationship locally on the capillary walls, which just tells you that the pressure is locally constant and varies on the, on the tissue scale, which is exactly what you would expect. Then if you go to the order epsilon system, you can then work out the correction to that. Um, again, you get that the Laplacian the local Laplacian of the next order correction to the pressure is zero, um, but now you have a non-zero flux component. So essentially you've got a local flux that depends on the um, how much the um, leading order pressure field is varying globally. And now to solve this system, you can essentially exploit the linearity and um, separate it into terms that vary just globally and locally. So here, this is an ansatz essentially for how you can write down the solution for the order epsilon correction to the interstitial pressure uh, in terms of the global leading order pressure component and a component here that's unknown, um, but just varies locally. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> and then when you plug that into your equations, you essentially get what we call a cell problem for this pressure. Which, determines just on, which is determined just by the local problem. So this is the equation that you have to solve for this um, capital P, which is what we call a cell variable. And once you know, once you prescribe the geometry on the micro scale, you can essentially solve this problem. And that tells you the order epsilon pressure correction. And then finally, if you go to order epsilon squared, um, you get this system of equations. So this is the conservation of mass equation again, and this is the U dot N is equal to the pressure drop equation. Um, and now, essentially, if you average over this um, over a microcell, it gives you this equation here for the tissue scale leading order pressure, um, which is essentially a kind of average Darcy law porous medium type model. And what's useful and interesting here is that this E is a permeability tensor, which you can calculate by essentially averaging the cell variable once you've determined it. So it's this E. Um, that gives you the dependence of the global problem on the microscale architecture and mechanics. Um, and then essentially the, the capillary pressure acts as a sink in the porous medium model for the um, interstitial pressure and vice versa. And this R here is the vascular permeability factor. So basically for more permeable vessels, that's um, that will be retained in here, but for less permeable vessels that will be knocked out, as you might expect, and you lose the coupling between the vascular and the interstitial phases. Um, so long and the short of that is that by using this kind of approach, you can essentially derive different um, models um, for the um, capillary and interstitial pressures on the tissue scale. And here they are. So essentially, based on these, all these assumptions, they behave as a kind of double dual porous medium. Um, where um, each of the variables appears as a sink in the other one, and um, you've encapsulated the permeability of the vessel walls. And then to solve these models on the tissue scale, you can solve your permeability tensors, which encode the um, structure of the microarchitecture in the model. So this is essentially one approach um, to looking at tissue tiles transport if you want to understand the role of microscale architecture. And to, to show really how how you can then use this model, I thought I'd talk through a quick case study, um, which is on um, a cardiac example. So this is a section um, of a cardiac muscle wall, essentially. So epi and endo, this is the epi, so um, outside of the wall, and this is the endo to so the inside of the wall, and this is basically the um, heart muscle. So it's, um, and the, these are all the vessels that have been resolved. The largest vessels are about 
75 um, microns in diameter and the smallest ones are down to about five micron diameter. And um, what's really interesting, well, there's one of the things that's interesting about um, the cardiac wall is that the muscle fibers essentially align, sorry, the, the blood vessels essentially align in the muscle fiber sheet directions. So you actually do have quite a highly aligned and structured um, microcirculation, which, which makes them quite amenable to these kind of models where we've made this assumption of um, regularity in the microarchitecture. Um, so essentially here we're interested in understanding if we've got this kind of information on vascular architecture, what can we um, learn from it in terms of what blood flow and perfusion looks like. And now I mentioned about the um, alignment with the underlying muscle fibre sheet direction. So, so what we did there to kind of pull out those um, directions was do a principal component analysis of the muscle fibre directions and the longitudinal capillaries. And I should say that I should have a picture of it actually, but um, in these kind of tissues, you have these structures where you have um, you have a dominance of longitudinal capillaries, um, which kind of run parallel to each other, um, um, running along the muscle fiber directions. And then it's a bit like a ladder structure. There's cross-connecting capillaries um, in plane, and then there's a very small number of cross-connecting capillaries that connect across the different muscle fiber sheet planes, if that makes sense. So it's highly aligned um, and highly structured. Um, and this is what the fiber sheets look like, and also the longitudinal um, capillary kind of sheets look like. Um, so what we did was essentially look at this data set and extract um, the vessels that were in the different planes, what their vessels diameters and lengths were, and then use that to essentially populate the permeability tensors in the model descriptions that I described previously. Um, and I won't go into kind of a high level of detail, but essentially you can classify capillaries as either being longitudinal or cross-connecting either in sheet or normal to the sheet, depending on um, the spherical polar angles that they make with respect to the principal component analysis that I just mentioned. And then, you know, based on some definitions of what you classify as each of those type of capillary, which is, you know, relatively arbitrary, um, you can classify vessels as longitudinal, in sheet or normal, and then extract things like their length and diameter properties. So you can see that diameters don't really vary across the different types. Um, the lengths do vary a bit um, and the numbers. So the vast majority of the vessels are these longitudinal ones that are running along in parallel in the muscle fiber sheet direction. So based on that, basically we extract all of those data and use that to populate um, synthetic networks, which we then use as the microcell problem to solve the microcell variable um, cell problems that I talked about previously. So we did that stochastically. So essentially we have distributions for each of these diameters and lengths of the different vessel types. Um, and then we generated these syn synthetic structures. I mean, we did this a thousand times for each, um, for each trial, if you like. Um, and then on this, we basically solve the blood flow problem um, to calculate the permeability tensor associated with the vascular phase. Um, and this is an example of, of what you then get out. And this, this kind of permeability tensor captures the, the macroscopic perfusion and how it depends on this architecture. So you can see that you get a dominant 1-1 um, one, one component, which is because of this dominance of the, the longitudinal vessels with kind of much smaller off-diagonal components, um, as you can see here. So we did that about a thousand times for sampling from the um, length and diameter distributions to generate the synthetic networks each time. And then what's quite interesting is that you can then use that to look at different features of, of what perfusion looks like in these kind of tissues. Um, and this is just one of the results um, um, that's quite interesting. So here you've got a plot of the mean permeability as you move from the um, inside to the outside of that, um, the, the, the wall, if you like. Um, and you can see that as you go from the inside to the outside, there's a significant drop in the permeability. And essentially when the heart is contracting, the inside contracts more than the outside. So the hypothesis here is that this underpinning um, um, difference in the an anatomical, you know, the blood vessel diameters essentially in the inside and the outside is essentially an anatomical compensation for muscular contractions, which is hypothesized to mean that perfusion in particular of oxygen can be maintained um, even throughout contraction. 
So these are the kind of things that you can then start looking at to understand more about what the anatomy means in terms of kind of functional measurements that you might see in different medical scans. Right, so that kind of closes what I'm going to say about the averaged models. Um, as with all models, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, in terms of advantages, it's certainly interesting um, to have a better understanding of the link between microarchitecture and tissue scale properties. Um, and the framework's also very um, generalizable to different model models, um, in particular looking at things like solute transport and solid mechanics. And we've, we've done quite a bit of work on each of those. And if you're interested, there's a couple of papers there that you might like to read. The models that you get out are quite simple, so they're computationally tractable. Um, but there are some significant assumptions in there which have quite a lot of um, implications on how they can be used in practice. Um, first of all, the assumptions of periodicity. That works quite nicely if you have highly organized tissues like the cardiac example that I just gave. But um, as I'll show you in a minute, if, you, if we're gonna look at things like tumors, that, that assumption really isn't very valid. <laughs> Um, and the other thing that they kind of average out is the um, hierarchy. You know, I mentioned at the beginning that you have this kind of continuous hierarchy of larger vessels going down to smaller vessels. And that's not embedded in this approach. We've got an assumption of two different length scales which are well separated. So again, that's a pretty significant um, limitation of this kind of approach. So next I'm gonna talk about discrete models. Um, and by discrete, I mean where we describe flow in individual vessel segments. And I'm going to do that through a case study on um, essentially tumours. So again, I, I suspect most of you know quite a bit about tumours already. Um, but from the point of view of this talk, um, tumours essentially are very different to um, normal tissues. Um, they've got an abnormal or unusual vascular architectures. They can often be chaotic in structure, so they're less regular in structure. You often lose some of that hierarchy that I just mentioned. Um, you can get very permeable vessel walls, so very leaky vessel walls. Um, similarly, the interstitium is unusual, um, um, and there's a lack of functioning lymphatics, um, which is the drainage system of fluid out of the interstitium. So um, tumors are essentially very complex. They vary a lot, so they have a high level of heterogeneity. Um, across individual tissues. So you take one tumor and look at different locations within it and you'll get very different microvascular architectures, for example. And they also vary a lot um, from individual to individual. So if you took two people, for example, with the same tumor type, you might get quite different information about architecture and um, just general function. So in many ways, they're, <laughs> they're the like, least sensible candidate for developing models. Um, because there's so much variability, but they will say very interesting and there's a lot of um, need to have kind of modeling frameworks that can lend understanding in these kind of settings. So we pursue, pursue them nonetheless. Um, and this just, this gives, this is actually a very old example, but it just gives you an example of the kind of um, barriers to getting drugs into tumors, which are, um, you know, very well understood and common now, but, but here, this is essentially a histology image of a slice through a tumor. Um, you can see the red blood vessels, um, and then there's two different stains. One is the green stain, which is for hypoxia. Hypoxia is essentially low oxygen status, so lower than you would get in a kind of normal healthy tissue. And tumors are kind of characterized by having quite a high hypoxia status. So they essentially grow until they reach their oxygen limit, and then the vasculature will continue to evolve and remodel to enable them to continue growing aggressively. Um, so essentially, the further you get from vessels, obviously the oxygen is transported by diffusion from the, from the vessels. So after you get to a point, then you will get these low oxygen zones. And then doxorubin is a pretty kind of standard chemotherapy drug, which again is delivered to the tissue by diffusion from the vessels because it's delivered systemically in the in the blood supply. And you can see that you get this like localization of um, drug around the around the vessels, which is essentially a consequence of the the balance between diffusion and uptake by cells. So the, the struggle here is that if you give a drug, then it's very hard to get it into the main body of the tissue. So understanding the kind of balance of these transport properties is really important for kind of informing um, drug dosage and development and that kind of thing. And again, for tumors, we have the same kind of requirement that I talked about earlier about understanding what information means across different length scales. Um, so, you know, if, if someone has a uh, 
cancer, then, you know, in terms of the kind of assessments that would be done clinically, that person might have an MRI image, for example, to try and um, understand and visualize information about the tumor and that's kind of tissue scale imaging. And this is an example here. Um, and then they might also get things like biopsies done where you take a sample of the, of the tissue and, and look at it under a microscope and essentially look at the histopathology. And that's really invasive, but gives you very fine scale information. Um, so, you know, there's another interest here, which is very similar to the, one, to the one I mentioned in the previous example, which is about how information that you might get in a biopsy and the fine scale um, relates to the kind of average tissue scale information that you might get in non-invasive imaging. Um, we haven't answered all of that yet by any stretch, but <laughs> that should, um, it's, it's um, uh, you know, a, a very active area of research across many, many different groups. So here I'm going to talk about some Im combination of imaging and modeling that we've been doing um, over the past few years to look at uh, fluid distribution in um, colorectal cancers. Um, so this is all collaborative work with Simon Walker Samuel, who's a professor in um, imaging essentially here at UCL. And he runs a group that develop a range of um, imaging modalities to look at both fine scale and kind of MR MRI scale um, um, imaging tools and image analysis tools. Sorry to get a drink. So, um, so essentially, um, Simon and his group have developed a range of optical imaging techniques to look at the really fine scale vessel architectures in whole tumor samples. And this is an example of doing that in 3D um, for colorectal tumors. So this is one particular colorectal cell line called the LS147T. And these are all set up in mouse models. Um, and essentially what you do is that you perfuse the tumor with a fluorescent lectin, which binds to the blood vessels. Um, you then optically clear the sample. So this on the left is the tumor before and after optical clearing, and then image the vessels using optical projection tomography or APT. And essentially this enables you to reconstruct the vascular architecture for whole tissue samples down to quite fine scale resolution. Um, and they segment the vessels using quite a, this kind of standard method called frangy filtering. But these are the kind of structures that you can then um, kind of digitally reconstruct and analyze. So this is, um, we've done this for whole tumor samples. So this is a whole, whole colorectal cancer, <coughs> as I said, in a mouse model. This distance is about a millimeter. The smallest vessels go down to about five micron diameter, which is about the smallest vessels that you would expect to be getting. And they're color coded here according to their diameter. And you get these really kind of beautiful images where you can see all of these kind of architectures. And then the question is, of course, what can you do with them? <laughs> so it's really useful and beautiful to be able to visualize this kind of thing. And it's you know staggering that we can get this kind of resolution. Then the next question is, what do these kind of structures mean and, and how can we usefully use them? So this is quite a neat video that basically shows you the same thing. So this is zooming through one of these um, colorectal cancers and just shows you the kind of scale of the data. So these are all the blood vessels um, and how they kind of, the structures really are, well, it depends on the cell line to be honest, but they can be quite spatially heterogeneous. But this is, um, you know, really big data sets. One of the challenges of this modeling is the size of the data sets and the computational cost of working with them. So essentially we've set up this kind of pipeline, if you like, that we've called um, reanimate, which stands for, this, this took quite a lot of um, brainstorming, but realistic numerical image-based modeling of biological tissue substrates. Um, um, and the idea here is that we want to be able to extract these kind of data, um, but then use them to better understand what that means in terms of perfusion and things like drug delivery and um, you know the kind of perfusion maps that you would get using things like MRI and really understanding how we could develop models that are benchmarked and parameterized by the kind of data that we get in these settings. So it's all based on animal models so these are all mouse models. Um, I just talked about the ex vivo imaging so this is you know once the tumors have been grown up you um, excise them and do the optical imaging that I just mentioned, um, where you can extract the high resolution vascular architectures for the whole tumors. You segment them 
Um, and then you've got this kind of computational kind of substrate for blood flow models. So we then overlay those with um, descriptions of blood flow and pressure throughout the network, which I'll talk you through in a moment. We can then simulate um, basically the pressures and velocities in all of that network. But how do we know that they're accurate or meaningful? And so what we've also done at the same time is that before these tumors were um, excised, done things like MRI, so we get the perfusion maps for the same tissue samples that we've got the vascular architectures for. So we use that information to benchmark the mathematical models. And then we kind of simulate things like drug delivery and use that as a tool to kind of um, generate hypotheses and test different um, delivery scenarios that we can feed back into the experimental setups. So I'm going to talk through this in a bit more detail, but this kind of gives you a high level overview of the different components that go in um, to this reanimate framework. So we've got the biomedical imaging and there's an ex vivo component, which is the optical imaging. And there's an in vivo component, which is, for example, the magnetic resonance imaging. And then we've essentially got blood flow models and drug delivery models. Um, and the blood flow models involve segmenting all the vascular architectures and then developing um, models of the flow in those in those vessels. Um, we also do an interstitial flow model, which is a bit like the one that I talked about previously, where we model the um, flow in the interstitial phase using a Darcy type approach. And that's obviously coupled to the vascular flow model via the boundaries, the vessel boundaries. Um, so again, we use Starling's law for that. Um, there's a big question in all of this about how you assign boundary conditions. And essentially, I'll talk you through how we did that. Um, but we benchmark that process against the in vivo imaging data and iterate between the two so that we've got some confidence that our models are predictive. And then we've overlaid onto that a kind of drug delivery platform where we can simulate delivery of either a tracer or a drug, for example, that gets convected through the blood vessel networks and diffuses out into the interstitial phase and then is obviously highly coupled with the blood flow model. So I don't have time to talk through all of this. Um, but that kind of gives you an idea of how everything fits together. And then I'll show you some examples of how, it, how it's been working and not working. So the first stage is the image feature extraction. Um, so I mentioned that briefly, but you get these um, APT images um, where you've imaged the fluorescence of the vessels, essentially. Well, sorry, you've imaged fluorescence, which correlates with the, where the vessels are. And so the first stage is extracting that um, to get the architectures. We essentially assume that each all the kind of vessel segments can be described in this kind of simplified format here, where you've got you've got vessel bifurcations or nodes um, um, with connecting vessels that we approximate as cylinders. And obviously, if you've got a wiggly vessel, you can discretize along that vessel with lots of little cylinders to take account of the tortuosity. Um, and they all all the vessels have got a diameter which we want to extract and a length, which is essentially the length of that vessel segment. Um, so that's the kind of data that we extract from um, these images. So you get basically the 3D coordinates for all of the nodes, um, and then the diameters and lengths of all of the connecting segments. And then um, we overlay that with a blood flow model. So I talked previously about how we set up continuum models. Um, the discrete models are quite simple. Essentially, we assume, as I said, that each vessel segment's a cylinder and that we can describe the blood flow within it using Poiset's law, um, which basically just relates the flux down the cylinder to the pressure drop down it. And the constant of proportionality um, scales with the fourth power of the diameter. So it's really sensitive to how accurate that um, segmentation process is and is inversely proportional to the length and the viscosity. And then, you know, there's a, there's a huge literature on this that's been largely developed by um, Axel Fries and Tim Seckham. Um, but you can describe the viscosity in different ways to account for um, important features of viscosity at the scale of the microcirculation. So including things like the um, um, hematocrit distribution, the apparent viscosity and how that depends on vessel diameter. Essentially, blood isn't just, uh, it's not just like water, it's, um, um, a mixture of cells and plasma. And so its rheology has got quite complex properties, especially when you're looking at the scale of the microcirculation. But there's ways to encapsulate that through these kind of relationships that fit into the Poise flow, flow framework. And then what you do is essentially um, write this down for every segment in your network. And then at the 
boundaries, um, you write down conservation of flux, which gives you a linear system to solve for all of the pressures in the network. <coughs> I've noticed I'm getting quite close on time once I say to speed up. Um, one of the big challenges here is that we don't know what the boundary conditions should be on the network. So essentially you need a single, you need at least one pressure condition to have a unique solution. And um, you then need a flow condition on every terminal um, vessel segment in the network, which obviously we don't know. <laughs> you can't measure, you can't measure information at that scale for a whole tissue. Um, but we do have the perfusion information at, at, at the kind of tissue length scale. So what we did was implement the boundary condition estimation algorithm, which was developed um, again by Tim Seconds group, which basically um, estimates unknown boundary conditions, basically based on matching to target pressure and target shear stresses for the whole network. Now, of course, you don't know what those target pressures and shear stresses should be <laughs> for an individual tissue, um, but that gives you two parameters that you should be matching to as opposed to potentially tens of thousands of unknown boundary conditions otherwise. And essentially what we did was to set this algorithm up to estimate the boundary conditions and then interpolate between that and the measured perfusion information from the MR MRI until that we've got a good match between the two. We then coupled that to an interstitial flow model um, which I've mentioned before. So we described the interstitium using a porous medium type framework, which I've already talked about, so I won't go into the details. Um, but essentially here you can solve it, instead of having to solve the whole um, throughout the kind of interstitial domain using like a finite difference or element approach, what we did was set up a, a different solution method where you distribute um, point sources along the vessel lengths, which provide point sources of flux into the continuum domain. And then Essentially, you just need to solve for the unknown source strengths rather than for the, all of the points of the tissue domain, if that makes sense. Um, and we did that by estimating um, or distributing those, or well, using a Green's function approach, essentially, which I won't go into the detail of in the interest of time, um, but it's all in our papers if you're interested in finding out more. And then the final component in this is that the vascular exchange. So we use a similar relationship to to the um, ones that I described previously for the continuum models where you essentially um, link the flux across the vessel walls to the pressure drop. And you can also incorporate things like the oncotic pressure coefficients and other components of complexity. So that kind of summarizes how this bit in the red box works. Um, and now I'll just show you how some of the simulations have panned out and then I'll stop talking. <laughs> so these are the kind of, um, simulation results that you get. So this is again an LS147T, so one of the colorectal um, tumors. And you know you can now get predictions of vascular pressure in every segment in the vascular network and the blood flow, sorry, the pressure in every <laughs> node in the network, the blood flow in every segment in the network. And then uh, we've also obviously solved for the interstitial fluid velocities. And this is a visualization of what the velocities and pressures look like in the interstitial phase. And this kind of compares with the counterpart um, MRI information. Um, and then you can do things like layer on delivery of different agents. So this is just a, this is a tracer. So it's gadolinium DTPA, which is a kind of standard um, imaging contrast agent, but you can then simulate exactly what they would do in the mouse model and look at how that um, tracer is perfused through the tissue. And one of the things that we did here, and I think is really important, is compare what we get from the imaging with what we get from the modeling. So essentially on the top here, you've got the predictions of the reanimate framework. So these are the predictions of the model. So this is looking at a particular slice through the tumor um, in time, and it's our predictions of the gadolinium concentration. Um, so 0, 1, 5, 8, 13 minutes. And this is the measured um, concentration using dynamic contrast enhanced um, magnetic resonance imaging. And you can see that we pick up essentially very similar um, spatial maps across the two, which gives us some confidence in the predictability or the predictive power of the model. And again, here, um, you can then obviously for a particular location map out or different locations, you can map out what these concentrations look like in time. And again, we got a good, good match between the simulated and the measured fields. I'm kind of conscious of, I don't think I really have time to go through this, um, but if you're interested, <laughs> read about it in our papers. But essentially what we then did next was to 
um, look at different therapeutic scenarios. So, so this is a particular example of using a vascular disrupting agent, which is one therapeutic avenue that's, um, you know, is being explored for treating tumours, essentially to try and control features of the vascular architecture to enable enhanced um, delivery of a drug. Um, so this is, so we basically simulate a delivery of a particular agent which disrupts the vasculature. Um, essentially, it knocks out vessels, um, but the uptake and the response is very heterogeneous. So we were interested in understanding whether this kind of reanimate framework could lend any insights into uh, which vessels get knocked out and you know, how to optimize how it's um, delivered. So essentially here, um, we went through this kind of pipeline twice, imaging pipeline twice. So um, this is the same tumor type, um, but there were two different fluorophores, so diff two different fluorescent markers essentially. So um, there was a kind of baseline measure and then the um, Oxy4503 was delivered. And then two hours later, we repeated the um, vascular um, imaging or uh, well, tagging and then imaging again so that we could see which vessels have been knocked out. Um, and essentially here, the green vessels, the ones that went, were knocked out and the blue ones are the ones that remained. And the issue is that when you look at it, it's really, you know, when you look at which vessels stay and, and get knocked out, it's really heterogeneous. Um, so it's hard to predict um, why that is. Um, and essentially we kind of modeled it using the reanimate framework and you can do that for different tumor types. So we did it for two different tumor types, um, both colorectal, but two different colorectal cell lines. The LSs are quite poorly vascularized. The SWs are very highly vascularized. And you can see that um, for the SWs, basically they're more able to resist the loss in flow by rerouting a flow down different um, routes. Um, and essentially you can then kind of test hypotheses around how you might optimize delivery of these kind of agents. So I'll finally conclude. Sorry, I've talked a lot. Um, the pros and cons of the discrete models. So the discrete models have lots of benefits and lots of limitations too, much like the continuum ones, um, but they do provide a tool to basically um, modeled um, high resolution imaging data that's now becoming much more regularly available. And um, they also give this kind of platform and tool that allows you to look at important questions across different length scales, so delivery of drugs, all these kind of things. Um, they're very computationally expensive if you want to apply them to whole tissue samples and they have limitations. And, and I mentioned boundary conditions, but um, you know how you assign boundary conditions and other parameters is really challenging and also very important to get right if, if you want your models to be predictive. I'll just say a couple of words on, is there a middle ground? Um, you know, I've, I've talked about two kind of extremes of approaches. I've talked about continuum models where you everything, average everything out um, um, and just have a micro scale and a macro scale. And I've talked about discrete models where you don't average everything, <laughs> anything at all, and you treat every vessel individually. Um, naturally, there should be a middle ground. Um, and this, these are areas that we're still actively working on. But if you're interested, there's a couple of papers out there. So this is a, an example where we kind of it's very idealized, but we extracted out different layers of vasculature, if you like, so arterioles, venules, capillaries, and, uh, and a tissue scale. So you have a kind of layered porous medium approach, but you could obviously assign different properties to different um, stages of the vascular tree, if you like. I won't talk through that much in detail. And then we're also developing approaches where, well, based on smaller networks, where we essentially um, strip out the branching structures and couple that to continue models for the capillary bed and then test how, how well they do. Um, and like any of <laughs> any of these models, they depend a lot on boundary conditions and parameter values. Um, so I think those are both interesting areas of work that we're still at to be looking at. Um, and I'll finish there. So hopefully, um, hopefully that was interesting. I think there's a whole range of um, interesting methods and opportunities for mathematical modeling in these kind of um, scenarios. And it's really, I personally find it really interesting to work really closely with biologists and um, imaging people and um, to develop models that can hopefully be useful in both the diagnostic and um, therapeutic setting. So thank you very much um, for your time. And if you've got any questions, it'd be lovely to try and answer them. It was a really interesting talk. Um...
I do have a few questions, but I'll open it out first. <laughs> Or uh, filling your remaining time. So, Bec so Becky's got to go for three. So uh, I, I can probably stay till five past. So, if that's helpful. Uh, so <laughs> maybe while people type them out or put their hands up or whatever, I'll. Uh, I, I was wondering with the. Oh, there we go. I oh, know. Okay, that's not a question. Just a, a compliment saying it's a good talk. But that's good. Yeah, so that's good. If you're using the MRI data to to get the boundary conditions, essentially. Is there a chance you're kind of guaranteeing your, I mean, in some way you're guaranteeing you get the right results from your simulations? Yeah, so I probably didn't explain that very well. So um, we don't take the MRI data as boundary conditions. What we do is run this algorithm where we basically, we have to just prescribe values for this target pressure and target shear stress in the network. And then we run that and it estimates the boundary data and solves for the network pressures and flows. So you get a solution essentially. And then what we do is then calculate the perfusion map across the tissue and compare that against the MRI data. And of course they don't agree very well to start with. Um, and then, so we go back and basically update the parameters in the algorithm and basically iterate until we're, you know, well, you can use whatever metric you, you might want to inform whether you've done a good enough job or not. But um, so, so it's not that we just lift the boundary conditions from the MRI data, it's more that we inform the parameters in the um, discrete model yeah. in, that, in a kind of loop. Okay, yeah, but I guess it's, the, uh, yeah, so it's not, so you can't predict everything. From it's not independent, no, yeah, it's That's not independent, no. So I guess like ultimately you might try and do this for different tumor types or tissue types and have a kind of portfolio of parameter values that, that might be relevant, but um, but you, you would kind of want to check it each time a bit as well. Okay. Uh, as as uh, Rachel, do you have a question? I know she popped your video on. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Good to see you. Um, really nice talk and, and great to see sort of the mathematics that can be applied uh, to these problems. Um, I've got a slightly different question, though. In terms of the collaborative work you do, and, you know, particularly some of the, the, the more recent work that you were presenting, it's, it's part of a... a you know, very, very much an interdisciplinary team um, working together. And I wondered if you can kind of share any sort of top tips or, or your experience of, of collaborating um, with, with, you know, as mathematicians, uh, sometimes it can be challenging and it'd be really nice to hear about what you think, you know, helps you be successful at that. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, I guess, I, you know, looking back, when I kind of started doing it, you know, right from when I started doing research for my PhD, it was in um, modeling in, so I started working on tumor modeling then. So I guess it was kind of inbuilt in my kind of <laughs> academic um, DNA from that point that it was a good approach. Um, you know, I think it can be really challenging. There's a lot of the kind of obvious things that can make it challenging, like having a common language, um, to communicate you know vocabulary how you communicate the maths how how your collaborators communicate the biology um so i think you know it really takes it you can't really underestimate how much effort and how long it takes to develop those relationships to that point if that makes sense it's not something that you can just do overnight <laughs> it takes a lot of hours over cups of tea talking to each other and making sure that you really understand what each other are doing and i think what i've tried to do um and I'm really quite committed to is genuinely making that we develop the models alongside the kind of in this instance the imaging methods etc which you know kind of takes a lot longer than it would do if you just did either in isolation so in that sense you know it means that it takes longer to get your papers out to, to, to kind of make progress in general um, but you know I'm really personally really committed to the modeling that I do being kind of hopefully a bit useful <laughs> to, to in these kind of settings and I think unless you're unless you do that you know I think there's often you know the other approach is that you can also use the kind of um our understanding of biology and medicine to inform very nice beautiful modeling um you know there's really rich problems in biology and medicine that you can model mathematically um but the kind of I guess the emphasis on what you want to do there is slightly different. So it kind of depends where you are on that, on that kind of spectrum of what you're trying to do. Um, so yeah, I think it takes, 
a lot you know I think you have to be really open to just asking what seem like really daft questions you know um I've had to ask really really simple questions <laughs> to you know biology questions I stopped doing biology at GCSE level so an awful long time ago um and I think you need people who are very happy to sit and talk at that level and prepared to explain their own disciplines um and you know and I think spending time in other group meetings and other lab meetings and that kind of thing really helps as well so you know, I go to the lab meetings for my um, imaging or, you know, cancer collaborators or tissue engineering collaborators. Not every week, it's not possible. There's not enough hours in the day. But I think actually spending time in that setting and in the lab and understanding the experiments and how they're done, how they're set up um, is really important. So that, you know, when you want to do this process of trying to parameterize and validate models, you have a genuine understanding of where the data have come from. <laughs> um, so sorry, that wasn't very coherent. It was more a bit more of a <laughs> random thoughts on the topic, but, but yeah, it's challenging, but I think really rewarding as well. Thanks, Becky. That was really, really helpful. Uh, any, <laughs> anybody, anybody else got any questions? Um, I guess I, I did have one more, but it was kind of technical and maybe a bit boring. Um, the, the slip condition uh, for the, the capillaries in the, in the initial part of the talk, but, um, is that because there's some flow in the interstitium or is it just, oh yeah, where, where does that come from, I guess? It's more... Yeah, well, you need it. I mean, you could just impose um, no slip and if you wanted, but essentially you need another, um, you need another condition. You need a condition on the tangential component of your velocity and you basically got Stokes flow boundaring on a porous medium flow. So you can have a boundary layer where the tangential component of the velocity is non-zero, mm -hmm. which can be captured using this condition. Although, you know, in all reality, that condition doesn't make much difference to the overall solution. So um, I kind of skated over it because it's not one of the most important parameters. It's more, it's more in the interest of formulating it um, okay. in a, yeah, in a robust way. I guess the alternative is some kind of stress continuity or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Rebecca. Um, no, I think the, the only other question I asked is about the hierarchy of the structures, but uh, I'll, mm. so I'll hand it over. Then you answered it essentially in saying we can't deal with it, and that's right. <laughs> so uh, uh, go. I think Igor had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's a wonderful talk, Rebecca. Thank you. And since you're on this slide and you know, assuming periodicity, I wonder if alternatively you can assume distribution of shapes and, and total statistical uniformity of your shapes. So, did you or your group? Took this approach or, or thinking of taking it well we haven't done it but i agree that that would be that would be a nice approach to look into definitely um and you can do things like have say the purity is is really quite a significant assumption um but you can also do things like have that um periodic length scale varying on the tissue scale <laughs> you know um um so that there's there's lots of things or, you know and there's so there's lots of things that you can do um, and certainly a kind of more statistical approach would be very appropriate too, but no, we haven't done it yet, but maybe at some point, or maybe someone else will do it. But... Well, thank you. Uh, what, I'm just out of time. Uh, we should probably let you go. Um, okay, well, All right. that, that, that was great. Um, thank you very much uh, for that talk. And I'll, uh, you'll all have the recording if you want to go back and look at, look at that. And I'll send the recording to you as well, Becky, so you can use it for any purposes. Lovely.